Greetings. Thank you very much for joining me again today. My name is Matthew Pilmore. I'm president of VIP Financial Education, and this is another free training of our installment curriculum based on cash flow maximization. And this truly is secrets that your bank won't teach you. This class is known as our infinite banking concept. It's probably our most anticipated out of all of the classes that we've uh, created for your benefit. Um, it is a debt weapons exposed curriculum where we're going to talk specifically about the infinite banking concept and really just pull back the curtain on it so that you can understand what it means when people are out there trying to use this as a marketing tool. The objectives here today include exposing the truth behind this concept. Secondly, we want to teach you how to think, not what to think. We want to show you how to gradually eliminate the need for banks over time. This doesn't mean that you will stop using banks entirely, but if you can stack the odds more in your favor and create a more mutually beneficial relationship with the banks, this program and this particular debt weapon can contribute greatly to that. And finally, we wanna show you steps to prevent tens of thousands of dollars on future loans. How would you like to save tens of thousands of dollars without adjusting or sacrificing inside your lifestyle. Sounds good, right? Now we're gonna show you all of the steps necessary to do that and in exchange for your time and feedback, we're also going to be giving you some gifts at the end. So please stay all the way until the end and take a few moments in order to complete the feedback form that will electronically appear on your computer screen once this class uh, is over. Now, we've done a background check for you on our guest expert for today's training. First and foremost, the Paradigm Group, which Eric Crom is a partner of, they currently have an A rating with the Better Business Bureau. And you may ask yourself, why did I pick Eric to help me teach today's class? First and foremost, they are consumer advocate approved, which is important to me. The infinite banking concept requires an expertise that very few people I've encountered actually have, Eric being one of those people. He's been a participant in the infinite banking concept think tank, and he's educated thousands on today's concept. He's an active educator in the real estate community, which a lot of people are partnering this particular debt weapon with their other investment strategies. And he's a retirement planner slash expert and investment advisor. And the thing about this is that we're not here today to try and promote Eric, his services, or using him inside your planning process. We're here today to help open your eyes and expose you to, again, a way to think where you can actually um, kind of start questioning things and, and, and create a paradigm shift for yourself, which is kind of how their company name Paradigm Group came to be. Uh, so uh, we've brought Eric in to help you with that and allow you to work with your financial planner in a more successful way. Uh, Eric was in the lending industry for many, many years, so he understands what VIP is doing, how we're helping you understand how the bank generally makes money, and again, stack more of the odds in your favor than you may otherwise be doing. He's very active as an educator and an expert. He's hosted comprehensive talk radio show, shows on KOA, KHOW, Colorado Public Radio, and many, many other things that just quite frankly wouldn't even fit on this list. So uh, I'm going to introduce Eric here in a moment, but before I do, let's go over just a couple housekeeping details. As usual, this presentation is for educational purposes only. Numbers will be estimated. We do so and attempt to be conservative with them to help simplify the training for both you and us, the educators. But you will love this class just like you do all of our other trainings. It is extremely content rich. Uh, we're not here to provide you a bunch of fluff um, and, and dangle the carrot or tell you half the story. We really do want you to get all of your questions answered and then provide you the ability to get questions we're unable to answer during this training on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The training, however, is not a substitute for financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. And it's also not a promotion for Eric or my products or services. So we're not here to try and sell you anything. Uh, if it makes sense at some point for us to work together, then we can certainly talk about that. However, I will say this, you need to do your due diligence. I have selected Eric out of a number of different potential people to help uh, provide you this training here today, but it is not me suggesting you work with him in any way, shape or form. You need to work with the person that you feel comfortable with. And if somebody has referred you to this class, who is a, an expert in investing uh, and uh, investment tools, I would suggest you start with that person. For guidance pertaining to your specific situation or the governing laws in your state, 
please consult with specialists in your area, as many of them as you see is necessary in order to get you the answers you need to make intelligent decisions. There will be a free counseling session that is included as a second part to today's online class to help you safely understand how the infinite banking concept applies to your goals should that be something that you choose to take advantage of. In order to get the most out of today's class, just like all of our online trainings, your undivided attention is needed, which means turn off your phone, try and remain distraction free. It's not easy when you're watching something online. Take notes and write down your questions as you go because the second part will give you the opportunity to get those questions answered, which is that individual personal counseling session. There will be additional bonuses provided at the end if you have the endurance to make it that far. Now, before a solution comes a problem, right? There's nothing to solve if you don't have a problem. So uh, let's address that problem. The VIP money bank, Pig, wonders if it's actually true that if all the money in the world was distributed equally among all the people within 10 years, some say that 97% of the money would be controlled by 3% of the people. So who are those 3%? With that introduction, I'd like to go ahead and bring Eric Crom into the conversation. Eric, how are you today? I'm doing well, Matt. Thanks for having me. This is a concept, uh, as you mentioned, that you hear a lot about, and it's one of those concepts that you really need to be careful to understand. I love it, and I love teaching people about it, so I'm certainly uh, glad to be here today. Okay, great. So let's continue talking a little bit about the problem that demands a solution. And I believe that you can't do that with, without one of the key players, the bank, right? Dun, dun, dun. You got it. The uh, Of course, nobody's ever going to be able to test this theory, but the reason that we talk about 97% of the wealth being back in the hands of 3% of the population is because of the idea that there's only one pool of money in the world and that unless you prevent it, it will end up back in the banks. Now, most of you are fully aware, and if you aren't by now, you've probably been under a rock because 2008 taught us once again of the importance of the bank and power of the banks in our lives. They are the single most important entity that we have. In fact, the government is willing to put us in trillions of dollars in debt uh, just to save the banks. And the key here is banks are not just the most important business in the world. Banking is not just the most important and the most powerful business in the world. But more importantly, it is the most profitable business in the world. In fact, 36% of every dollar spent by the average American in this country is spent on interest. Okay. I and know that's through a variety of non-mortgage related debts, including housing, I take it? Housing, cars, living expenses. And we're going to go into this in more detail, but you really benefit from understanding this concept. 36% of every dollar. Now, some of you may be thinking, there's no way that this could be true because I've never had an interest rate even close to 36%. And I used to think that way too. Let me stop you there because I actually had created a slide to help us uh, understand this a little bit more clearly in an example that we've gone through in great detail through a current coaching membership student of Dan and Megan Albright. Now, you may remember in the 100% debt-free for life class, which hopefully you've attended by now, that the uh, subjects of that case study, Dan and Megan, uh, had a variety of current outstanding balances. Now, when we first started working with them, they did not have a mortgage. But what we went ahead and did here on this graph, Eric, was include the mortgage that they acquired after they paid off their non-mortgage related debts. So I just wanted to point this out in order to help substantiate the statement that you made where at least 36% of the average consumer's payments are going towards interest. And that's a that's a statement relating to the volume being the significance versus the actual rate itself. And we talk a lot about that in our debt-free class, right? Yeah, that's right. The fact, here, first of all, if this is not what you look like, maybe you buy everything in cash, maybe you don't have this kind of debt, maybe you have more. Let's go through this real quick in order to help the listener understand what we're looking at here, okay? So we've got automobiles here, $35,000 total automobiles. You may remember there was a cash flow cruncher that was provided to Dan and Megan that they completed in advance of 
starting their work with VIP to help them accelerate the elimination of their debt, designing a plan and sticking with it uh, and so forth. So this is a, a, an image of that, uh, that spreadsheet. And now everybody here who is listening today, if you don't yet have a copy of your cash flow cruncher spreadsheet, then we're here to give you one. And we're going to do that at no charge. That'll be a bonus that is provided towards the end of today's training. We'll talk a little bit about that. But you can see down here at the bottom, there's a number of different pages that are included with this cash flow cruncher spreadsheet. One of them being revenue and assets. You've got a debts page, living expenses tab. If you're in business, maybe you're an independent business owner, you have a small company, you can include business expenses and then action steps. So with that being said, uh, I just wanted to give you uh, a reminder of exactly what we're talking about as we are uh, looking at this here. Because when we first saw their cash flow cruncher, they had $35,000 in approximate automobile balances and a total of approximately $14,900 in credit card balances. And as you can see here, these were the minimum payments that were due. Now, even with the interest rates what they were, which is slightly irrelevant in my opinion, you can see that the interest cost each month total 291 and 142, and the principal being 452 and 242 left the total volume of interest percentage at 38% and 37%. So this falls right in line with what you're talking about, right, Eric? Yeah, the interest rates on these debts that you're looking at are nowhere near 38 and 37%. In fact, on that mortgage, I believe the interest rate is 5.2%. So we're talking about the importance being what was the first thing that you said in your head or that you thought about when I said 36% of every dollar was spent on interest. And the answer is most people go directly to interest rate. They think about the interest rate that they are paying or that they've paid over their lifetime. And I'm here to tell you that banks don't work that way. They want you to focus on interest rate because if you focus on the rate of interest that you're paying, you neglect the main issue, which is what you're seeing at the top here and in, this, in the red circle, which is the volume of interest that you pay. This is one of the ways that the banks, in my opinion, have the rules stacked against you because you think about interest rate and you don't think about volume. But at the end of the day, what if you added up all the interest that you've paid over your lifetime? What would it look like in volume? How much money would that add back to your life if you could avoid paying those levels of interest out and were able to recapture some? And that is largely what the infinite banking concept is all about. So here's the thing. We've, dis we've talked so far about the power and the importance of the bank. But we've also talked about the profitability of the bank. I don't think any of you doubt that banks are extremely powerful extremely important and very profitable. Can I ask you one question? Of course. How many people out of a hundred who might see this class, if asked the question, do the banks design their rules in favor of you and me, the consumers, would say that they are? Well, I think, I think most, 100% probably are aware that the banks stack the rules against them. The interesting thing is, I don't think most people understand how. Or what to do about it, maybe. Well, that's definitely true. And that's really, again, the uniqueness of the infinite banking solution. This is not the only place that you should put money. This is not the only retirement account, on and on and on. Well, how are banks profitable? The banks need three things to happen to be profitable. And the first is that they need folks to save money. They need savers to acquire the resources to be able to become a bank. And so what they need to do is they need to incentivize you and I to save money. Now, we can all argue till we're blue in the face about whether or not you're really incentivized to use a bank. But at this point, we're looking for the convenience and the safety and the protection that's provided by a bank. And right now, that's incentive for enough for most of us to use a bank. But the key thing here is the bank needs a saver and all of you have to save. So the bank benefits not only from needing someone to save, but from the idea that all of you need a place to save money as well. In addition to savers, the banks also need to make loans. Banks don't make money in large part unless they're not loaning their money, unless that money is not moving through their hands. And so they also benefit from the fact that in addition to all of you needing a place to save, all of you need to buy things to take care of lifetimes, needs, and wants. So you are a consumer and the bank is very clear about what they give you in that regard. They give you capital. They give you money to be able to buy things. Okay. So the two 
first parts that a bank needs is savers to put their money in and they need to incentivize you as the saver. Consumers who want to buy things and they need to provide you with that capital. Here's what they need to be successful. The bank needs, most importantly, the loans that they make to be paid back. We saw in 2008 what happens to a bank when loans are not performing, when they don't get paid back. And what the bank must have is they not only need the loans to be paid back, but they must charge an accurate rate or enough rate of interest to be able to profit. Okay, so again, here's the idea. Banks are extremely important. They're also very profitable. Banks need to have savers, consumers, and loans to be paid back. And all of you have to save and you all want to buy things. You're saying they, they have the opportunity then to reinvest the profits, right? And we talk about this in some of our other classes, but the way that you've designed your slide here just looks a little different. So it's uh, a different way of looking at the exact same thing, which I like about it because we discuss the benefits of being a so-called saver which includes checking and savings. And we talk about money being unemployed. Now you've seen our class. You remember when I say that approximately three quarters of your lifetime, if your money is sitting in a checking and a savings account because you, you got paid for the hard work that you've been putting forth for the last two weeks and you deposit that money, it sits in there unemployed until you use it, right? Yeah. And the bank needs that because they then take that money and they reinvest it, right? Absolutely. There. If you think about what the banking equation is doing. And remember, this is about the banking equation in your life. The saver is not getting a great deal here, even though we get the convenience, because as you said, their money is unemployed because they're really not earning anything. Right. We no use one, the bank for these reasons. Right. But well, the little interest is almost an, an insulting amount for me personally, right? Well, it's certainly not incentive enough for me to want to use a bank because can I get liquidity can I get safety and convenience in another place now again this is not your checking account this is your savings account yes you can in a lot of ways I believe you can duplicate the safety and the access to money but you can do better when it comes to making money on your money so this reinvestment of, of profits and reinvestment of deposits provides a substantial return on that investment to the bank, correct? The reality is the bank is the big winner here in this equation. But from both the saver and the consumer, and interestingly enough, you, you're you both. That's right. Most... And, I, and I'm both. So basically, you are lending me your money, and I'm paying the middle person, being the bank, the interest return, right? That's exactly right, because the reality is that a bank doesn't sell a product, they don't ship a product, it's a simple business based on transactions. And this is extremely important when we think about the infinite banking concept. There's gonna be three parts to today, and the first part that we're covering is how a bank works. And again, if we think about what we've covered so far, if banks are extremely profitable, and that's proven out by the fact that the volume of interest that nearly every one of you has paid over your lifetime is large, and a bank needs three things to happen to be profitable. There's a saver, which all of you are. There's a purchaser, a consumer, which all of you are. The bank simply controls the money. It's just a business based on transactions. And here's the beauty about that. If the bank doesn't sell anything and they don't ship anything and it's a business based on transactions, all they really do is control money. And now what you need to ask yourself is, do I really want to let the bank control the money or could I benefit? Could I reap some of the benefits that I give away to the bank by controlling those dollars? And that, my friends, is the most important part about what the infinite banking concept provides. So being able to understand our options is important here. One option, obviously, I think would be work by cash only, right? Yeah. Not, and, not realistic. Well, a lot of you, certainly a lot of my clients buy things in cash. But here's the issue. If you save in a bank and you put your money into the bank and receive virtually nothing as by way of interest from the bank, you too are losing money to the bank. So even though you may not be paying out 36% of every dollar in interest, you're, over your lifetime, you're giving up thousands of do potential dollars by not earning on your money. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a few slides, right? That's absolutely correct. Okay, so the uh, another option might be to utilize traditional banking methods and just kind of 
stay the course, which as we're starting to realize may not be the least expensive approach. Yeah, you you know, you saw in the interest slide how much money you'll pay to the banking institution if you stick with the traditional methods. But here's the thing, whether you work by cash only or whether you finance and borrow a bunch from the banks, at Ultimately, what you're doing is you're giving up thousands of dollars by way of paying interest out or by way of not earning interest. And if you look over a 20, 30, 40 year lifespan of what you've lost, there are major impacts, positive impacts that you could be making in your life right now if you have the discipline and the wherewithal to be able to to redirect some of this money and recapture that for you and your family. Which leads me to utilizing debt weapons properly. Um, for example, the infinite banking concept. So before we dive into the specifics behind the infinite banking concept, because I, I can probably assume that your curiosity is starting to grow, let's refresh your memory about debt weapons, which was originally taught to you in the 100% debt free for life training that we provided to you at no charge. As you may remember, debt weapons ultimately are here to create safety. And by virtue of their name, it can be a little confusing for people because you may automatically attach the term debt weapon to your liabilities. But in reality, debt weapons, for the most part, are designed to help you maximize cash flow. Now, VIP defines cash flow as the difference between what you earn on a monthly basis and what you spend on a monthly basis. And we use averages to calculate that number because if you're an independent business owner and you're paid inconsistently, then obviously your uh, cash flow is going to be a variable number. But it's a variable for everybody, even people who are W2'd and paid consistently, you know, those folks still have unpredictable expenses every single month. So maximizing cash flow is the first purpose of a debt weapon, and it is not by coincidence that that's at the top of the list. We're just going to go over all six purposes right now, and I'm going to spend a little more time describing these slides than I did in the 100% Debt Free for Life class because a lot of people uh, crave more detail about this. We just don't have time in each class to spend focused on every topic. Next, compress amortization schedules. So what we're allowing ourselves to do with debt weapons and proper execution of using them is shorten the lifespan of the leverage that we're using. And a lot of times that leverage is provided by the banks. For example, a mortgage. You know, a mortgage is, for many people, a 360 month term, 30 years. But in reality, you don't have to borrow that money for a 30 year timeline. If you could shorten it and pay it off in, let's say 25% of the time, would that not be something you'd want to explore? It should be. So that's what we allow ourselves the opportunity to consider when we use debt weapons properly. Third, you get to create better bank accounts. To refresh your memory, as I had mentioned just a few moments ago, when you use your banking accounts, checking and savings, the way that the bank requests, your money is sitting unemployed for as much as three quarters of your lifetime. So three quarters of the month, anywhere between 20 to 28 days of the month, your, your money just sits in the bank waiting to be used. And when that happens, you're not earning anything or you're earning very little. If you could actually put that money to work for as much as 100% of the year, would that not be something that you'd like to consider? It should be. So we're gonna look at replacing the inadequacy of our bank accounts and the infinite banking concept becomes one opportunity to do that. Fourth, you get to invest your, your money more quickly and safely. The bottom line about cash flow is that it gives you choices. So again, cash flow being defined as the difference between what you earn and what you spend. So that's uh, either a positive number or a negative number. If you spend more than you earn, then obviously negative cash flow is a reality of your life. Uh, but when you have more money left over at the end of each month than you do now, you have more choices. Those choices could include accelerating the elimination of debt, which we consider an investment, by the way. It could include stocks, bonds, annuities, insurance, real estate. It could include traveling the world, investing in your lifestyle. So investment choices are yours, but ultimately require cash flow. Fifth, they minimize the volume of interest that you pay. Again, Eric brought up a great point that we've alluded to many times in the past, which is concentrate on the total amount of interest that you pay throughout your lifetime. Yeah. Again, the banks have conditioned everyone to think about interest rate. And if you can just simply change one part of the way you view your money, which is to focus on the volume, I think it, it adds a tremendous potential to the things that you can do to positively impact your financial situation. 
Good. The final purpose of a debt weapon when used properly is to enhance your FICO scores and preserve a 760 or better. We're going to talk about that now. You have to have a minimum credit score of a 700 or better in most cases to access debt weapons. And we can help you with that process, identifying the key answers you need to actually go out and acquire debt weapons. And you can get between $2,000 to $150,000 per debt weapon with a 700 or better FICO score. Now, if you don't have that score, that's okay. We can help drive that score higher with the correct education. So again, you need a 700 or better. And there are score maximization solutions that are far more effective than credit repair. So don't despair if you don't have the score you need. If you've gone through some challenges in life and you were throwing a couple curveballs, that's okay. We can actually provide you the education you need to drive those upwards at no cost. Again, the target score though is a 760 or better. So if you don't have a high credit score of a 760, which is your Fair Isaac credit score, and that score can be located at myfico.com, or just go to our website and you'll find the credit scoring options there on the right menu. A less than perfect credit score can end up costing you as much as $64,000 over just a five year period of time. You know, five years is only 60 months. So that's over $1,000 a month in cash flow. And when you see all of our classes combined, you start to realize the significance of that kind of monthly cash flow and what it can do for you over a period of time. Just so you know, credit scoring requirements are subject to change over time. We can't control the rules of the banks, unfortunately, but we are aware of what those rules are doing at any given moment in time. Here's what it looks like if you do enroll as a VIP cash flow uh, cash flow maximization or accelerated debt elimination student, we do help you maximize your credit scores and, uh, and educate you on the steps needed to do that. This is just a, a screenshot of one of the accounts, an example account of what the accounts do look like when we're driving credit scores higher. This is a bonus. It's free to all VIP students and it does generally cost $1,500 per participant. So that is uh, individualized. If you're married, you and your spouse would have to have that. But again, it's completely free to our students. Here's a slide of the results that are possible in your credit scoring. Again, credit scores are such a significant piece to acquiring debt weapons. And one thing I love about the infinite banking concept is that it doesn't actually require a minimum credit score. Is that right, Eric? Yeah, you're not financing anything from a bank. There's nothing that any part of the infinite banking concept uh, has in it that involves the traditional banking uh, institution or relationship. But you do have to qualify for it, correct? You do have to qualify for it. We're going to touch on uh, what that means and how that works here in a little bit, but it's not through credit or uh, traditional banking methods. Okay. Now, one thing I want to remind you about that I've said over and over and over again, it's that at no point in time are you ever done looking for new debt weapons. So we always want more. So you should never be satisfied with the number of debt weapons that you have. And contrary to many of the uh, educators that are teaching about credit, there's no such thing as having too much credit. No such thing as having too much credit. The only time that you potentially could have access to too much credit is if you just don't have enough fiscal responsibility to manage the availability of that credit well enough. But you can see the potential of some of the education provided about credit scoring maximization techniques. And you can see this particular student, we took a screenshot of this individual when we first met them, and you can see their score was down here by the 550 mark. It was at a 549, and just over an 11-month period, you can see the score climbed to a 696. This is actually a screenshot from my FICO. So with just a few basic techniques and methodologies explained, this individual was able to drive their scores much, much higher very quickly. Now, the answers that you're going to need to seek in order to acquire the right types of debt weapons for yourself over time include which debt weapon should I get, where do I go to get it, when should I apply for it, and what purpose will it serve once I have it. Now, again, we're focusing on one specific debt weapon here today known as the infinite banking concept, and it's our goal to dispel a lot of the myths that come with that debt weapon, but it's very important for you to understand the answers to these questions before you go out and attempt to acquire any debt weapon, including the one we're going to talk about in detail today. We do research on these debt weapons and spend anywhere between 5 to 15 hours every single week in order to understand the answers to these four questions ourselves. So anytime somebody engages in our cash flow coaching 
we do actually help provide the answers to these questions to those individuals. So if you don't want to spend that kind of time yourself, that's okay. We can help you do that, provided that you're qualified for that service. Yet the key to a debt weapon is really understanding what the dangers are. Okay, there are a number of different dangers. We're going to talk about the dangers of the infinite banking concept here today, but there are dangers to every type of debt weapon. And unless you understand those dangers, you can certainly put yourself in harm's way. One final warning to debt weapons before we move forward includes minimizing credit available to yourself if you are not financially responsible. So if you have absolutely no control over yourself, you should not have access to capital. But let me warn you that if that sounds like you, boy, all I can do is wish you luck because you then wouldn't be able to manage even money in the bank. Okay, availability of credit is no different than having availability in a liquid form of any sort. So you, if you had $10,000 in the bank, just like you had $10,000 on a credit card, uh, theoretically, you would spend through that the same way that you would spend on your credit card. And, and frankly, I'm not quite sure how your financial goals will come true if that sounds like you. So discipline is the key to your success. But in the end, debt weapons will help create safety for you, your family, and future generations. So let's refresh on the debt weapons that we use every single day. We're going to go through this list uh, quickly and then any type of any further definitions that you may need, just reference back to your cash flow cruncher. As you can see here, when you go all the way to the left, there's a tab down here, a glossary of terms that will include uh, further definitions of each one of these acronyms. OK, so this one is mortgages. We do have a free class about mortgages. Personal lines of credit is the second. Business lines of credit is the third. HELOCs stands for home equity lines of credit, which is a secured form of a debt weapon. SLOCs, which also stands for secured lines of credit. CDs, business credit cards, and consumer credit cards. The top section here are debt weapons that are currently offered by the banks. And there are a number more, but these are the ones that we find most popular and mo most useful for the goals that our students are attempting to uh, achieve. The lower level here, includes debt weapons that are offered outside of the banking institutions, okay? Anything you see in gold includes a free class where you can actually see us expound on the details behind that specific subject. And the one here in blue is the one that you're attending here today, okay? So make sure you attend all those classes and those will be provided to you in the form of a bonus through email. Uh, so I would encourage you to take advantage of those invitations. The key to a debt weapon, Eric, that we've seen really benefit people in their ability to achieve their longer term goals over time includes the power behind what we call cash flow stacking, which includes a very specific three step technique where they can use these debt weapons in order to acquire income producing assets. Those income producing assets are then used where we apply a technique called paycheck or revenue parking back into the debt weapon which is then again used to acquire more income producing assets. And this cycle continues where the momentum begins to accelerate faster and faster and faster. And in some of our classes, you can even see people who have not only purchased income producing assets, for example, real estate, but have also been able to pay off the leverage that they used to acquire that asset in an unbelievably short period of time because the cash flow stacking gives them that type of speed or momentum with which they can do that. Where most of us are convinced from an investment standpoint to give money to some other institution and wait for the interest to acquire or accumulate with the infinite banking concept and, and the banking process in general, the idea is that you don't necessarily need to leave money sitting. The idea is to have money move and that movement of money can increase the volume of interest that you earn over your lifetime. So there's definitely some uh, synergy on that aspect. So let's dive right into the infinite banking concept, start to pull this curtain back, because frankly, I'm a little bit annoyed by the way this debt weapon is being sold to, uh, to us as consumers. And I really want the listener to understand some, somewhat of the origin behind this. So can you tell us a little bit about the infinite banking concept? Yeah, I guess here's the first thing. What you've heard so far is obviously pretty compelling when it comes to the idea that infinite banking is about solving the banking equation in your life. How do you profit to some extent like the banks and the fact that you have to save and you have to buy things means that it's already happening in your life so if you could control the money what benefit would that bring to the table anytime there is a concept 
that at face value seems so good, there's a there's an opportunity for things to be misleading when it comes to how the consumer uh, learns about this concept. And so in my opinion, there's only one clear cut way to learn this concept and it's through the founder R. Nelson Nash. You're looking at the cover of his book, Becoming Your Own Banker. Nelson spent 40 years in Austrian economics and this is really, really important because he has a very clear economic approach to this thing. This is not a get rich quick scheme. This is not uh, a way to make $100 quickly either. This is a long term monetary system as Nelson would say, which is a way for you and your family to create a family bank and solve what we call the banking equation in your lifetime. Nelson's also was an he was also an active real estate investor for 45 years. And this is really important because how Nelson came about discovering the infinite banking concept was that he owned a, uh, a large number of properties back in uh, the early 1980s. When interest rates went skyrocketing, he has, as he tells in his book, about a half a million dollar line of credit, which had moved up to a 23% rate of interest. And so he was looking for ways to solve this problem in his life, which is how he came upon the infinite banking concept. And then lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about the vehicle that you that you must use if you want to execute this concept the way Nelson created it, and that is uh, a life insurance policy. And again, we're going to cover that in a lot of detail, but Nelson spent 30 years as an agent for two major life insurance companies, which speaks to his expertise in the area. Well, let's talk about that now. What are, Who are the characters that are involved in order to successfully use this concept? So we're going to talk about three characters or actors in the play, so to speak. Number one is the banking process. We've talked about what the banking process is, the transactional nature and the profitability that it brings to the table. So that's what you need to know. If you don't believe that banks are profitable, you probably don't need to listen any further. If you don't believe that you would like to benefit from that profitability and understand that all it takes is controlling your money and a level of discipline, then you're also not right as well. And that is is the second piece which is overcoming human elements as you said earlier Matt discipline is the key it's the key to what you teach and it's the key to the infinite banking concept there are several human elements that we must overcome every single day if we want to be successful with the infinite banking concept and lastly is if I understand how profitable banking is and I want to put it in my life and I can overcome the human factors that are important for me to do it what vehicle is best to to use to provide me with the benefits of infinite banking? And the answer is dividend paying life insurance. And uh, so we're going to cover, we've already covered the profitability of the banks, but we're going to spend some time on the human elements and uh, the vehicle of life insurance as we move a little farther. Well, that's good because I've already got one foot out the door the second I hear life insurance, buddy. Uh, you know, I got to tell you, my my uh, red flags start going off and I start getting a little bit concerned. And I really like to act on behalf of today's listener because, you know, they're not here to ask you the tough questions. So are you ready to dive in and start uh, answering some of those for us and helping us understand why what everything I've potentially heard about life insurance should be second guessed? Yeah, absolutely. You know, again, this is just like what you teach. We're not talking about things that you've most of you have, have never heard before. We're talking about a lot of things that you've already been exposed to, but it's a different way of viewing it. And life insurance, in my experience in this industry, and um, I work on on all sides of this of the financial planning industry. But in my experience, life insurance is the most misunderstood vehicle when it comes to how to plan uh, for your financial future. Let's talk about the confusing nature behind this specific vehicle, because to me, it leads to some illusory marketing tactics. I mean, do you find that that's true as well? Yeah, without a doubt. Like I said, anytime that the concepts are very attractive, it opens the door for people to be taken advantage of. I'm not saying that any of these names here are are specifically places where you'll be taken advantage of. But again, I believe personally that the infinite banking concept, that top one, because certainly other people have tried to duplicate what Nelson's done. I believe that the true pure infinite banking philosophy concept and process is best suited by learning through uh, the infinite banking concept. And there certainly are individuals, whether it be salespeople, whether it be 
people writing books, whether it be people who have websites, there's a lot of people who I think pick out the few really attractive benefits of the infinite banking concept and don't spend enough time on some of those human elements, some of those banking principles that really are the key to making this thing work. Well, the most authentic version of any of these titles here, right, which is really all the same thing, just a, a different name, different wrapper of yep. the same exact thing, right? right definitely. So, so the the origin or the authenticity of this concept was conceived by Nelson. So why wouldn't we be listening to the so-called creator of this idea, right? Absolutely. I mean, I, again, I've looked at all the other ones and I continue to come back to Nelson Nash because I believe that the purity and the depth that he, that he looks at with this concept is far and away the, uh, like you said, the most authentic version. So in order for us to understand the vehicle that's necessary that you're describing, we must then understand insurance. And the way I understand it as uh, a real beginner on the subject includes both a combination of term and permanent life insurance, correct? Yeah, most young people have been exposed to one type of insurance and that's term insurance. And what term does is provide protection for your family. So it's more of a traditional life insurance, in my opinion, which means that there's no cash buildup. Um, well, what does CV stand for? Does that stand for cash? Is that's part of the cash buildup yeah, portion? Yeah, ca cash value, okay. which is the cash buildup. There's no cash buildup inside of a term insurance policy. As you can see here at the bottom, it provides short-term protection. So that's really the idea is that there's a death benefit in the unlikely event that as a young person you die sooner than you had hoped. Uh, you have protection for your family. And it, although it initially costs less, uh, Penn State did a study that shows 99% of term insurance policies lapse, which means that there are greater long-term costs, which means at some point, term insurance no longer becomes cost-effective. Your kids are gone. The houses are paid off. You don't necessarily need the income protection anymore, and so it goes away. Okay, so what you're saying is it lapses because it becomes difficult to afford it. It just doesn't make sense from an economic standpoint for me to continue to fund this policy uh, due to the, the policy um, premium. Yep. At some point, as you can imagine, you get closer to death, expenses are going to rise in a policy like this, and it's going to be too expensive for most people. Okay. Compared to the permanent life insurance side, what do we have here? Well, permanent life really, particularly when you use it for the infinite banking concept, it's all about the living benefits, not the death benefits. Okay. Now, well, we can talk a little bit more about what that means, right? Because to me, that doesn't mean a lot. And to the listener, the living benefits compared to the death benefits. Tell, tell us a little bit more well, about when that. You, you know, the, the traditional sense of life insurance is that when you die, your families get paid uh, because you had a policy. But most people are unaware that with a permanent life insurance policy, there's cash value, which acts as a saving component. And although the masses don't use it that way, you're going to see here that there's some pretty powerful uh, places where cash value has been used and is used. It's been around for hundreds of years. It's a really powerful concept to understand the cash benefits, the living benefits. And in fact, Nelson's concept, the infinite banking concept, is really built upon reverse engineering, for lack of a better term, a life insurance policy. And so rather than focusing on the cash benefits that could be accumulated, or excuse me, the death benefits that can be uh, built in, it's really focused entirely on the cash value or the living benefits that you can use, that you can benefit from in your life. You don't need to die to realize these benefits. So even th what, if, I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly here, Eric, even though this type of policy may initially cost more than a term policy, a percentage and perhaps even a significant percentage, dep depending on how this policy is designed, is going into this cash value. So the cost is acting as the savings slash investment. Yeah, I, here's the thing. Again, you offered this up at the beginning. If you already have an agent in your life, I'll be happy to talk to them about how to build this policy the way that you need to for infinite banking. But the reality is that because of the growth of cash, because of the cash value growth, you'll end up with more money than you put in into a policy over time, 
Whereas with term insurance, it's all cost. There's no cash. So you're never going to get any cash value or any living benefits from it. So key difference here is that over time, as you begin to earn more and more interest on the cash value of your permanent life insurance policy, the cost becomes less and less and less over time, as opposed to the opposite, which term is very inexpensive when you're young, but can be very expensive when you get older. There is two, two things that I'll tell you to kind of prove what is unknown about this. Number one, infinite banking concept. It's called infinite because a, in part because life insurance can be designed an infinite number of ways. And unfortunately, the life insurance industry, in my opinion, has done a poor job of educating the consumer about the fact that there are tremendous living benefits associated with this. The second thing I'll say to prove the value of the cash benefits inside of a life insurance policy is you don't need to look much further than the amount of money that these major banks have in this particular strategy or product. And folks, that's in billions of dollars. So again, just ask yourself the question, what do they know? that you don't. Why on earth would Bank of America have upwards of $18 billion stored in the cash value of permanent life insurance wow. if, if it was not a valuable tool to use? Where did you get this? This is right out of Nelson's book. So, And, and the other book that we use for a lot of our information is uh, Pirates of Manhattan, which is written by Barry Dyke, a great book which explains how the banks have stacked a lot of the rules against us. So if you don't mind, I'd like to take a slightly closer look at exactly what you're explaining here, okay? So we've got this IBC, which we now know means dividend paying life insurance, and it's starting to become more and more attractive as you explain it. So this is a whole life policy with mutual companies then. Yeah, so first, first thing, again, let's get back to this idea that you're a saver and you're also a consumer. So the idea is that if the bank just controls the money, where could I save money that wouldn't be in the control of a bank that I could then use, that I could then use those dollars to borrow and buy the things that I want? And the answer from Nelson's perspective of the infinite banking concept is a whole life insurance policy. And it's reverse engineered for high cash value. Now the key here is it needs to be done with a mutual company. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. If you need me to help you with that or to talk with your professional about that, I'd be happy to. But the key is a mutual life insurance company is kind of like a credit union in that you're the owner. And so for a lot of reasons, there's a huge value financially and from a safety perspective using a mutual company. The second thing is we overfund the cash value. So the idea here is that we are going to minimize the insurance benefits and maximize the cash value. And then those cash values are going to earn interest and dividends. So here's what you're asking yourself. If I have to be a saver and I know what the bank's giving me to save, do I think there's more benefits to save inside of a whole life insurance policy that's overfunded than I get in putting my money in a bank? And I can answer that question by saying over time, I certainly believe so. Because not only does it earn interest, but it receives dividends. It also accumulates this money on a tax favorable basis. What that means is that it's tax deferred. So every year that it grows, unlike your CD or your savings account, you do not have to pay tax on the growth, assuming it's built correctly. I want to say that again because if its policy can, is not built right, some of these benefits are not there. So not only does it accumulate tax deferred, but if it's built correctly, you can actually reinvest your profits, access your money, and use the money without income tax. I'll say that again. If it's built correctly and you use it correctly, you can utilize the money that you build inside of these policies without income tax. So again, let's think about that. I'm a saver. I get interest, dividends, and tax benefits, and I compare that to the benefits that I get in the CD savings account type vehicles that a bank provides. Now, not unlike any of our other classes where we're specifically emphasizing or highlighting a topic, we've designed this into a seven-step roadmap to help you better understand exactly what to expect through this process. So step one is to understand the pros and cons of the banking process, which we've discussed. Step two is, is to establish and evaluate your long-term goals so that you can reverse engineer those into your plan, basing all of your decisions and abilities around your cash flow. And that's done through your cash flow cruncher spreadsheet, which we referenced earlier. The third step is to then contact your trusted insurance professional. 
The fourth step of this roadmap, and hopefully you're writing these down, is to design your plan, then purchase your whole life policy. The fifth step is to consistently fund the premiums of that policy, which is a five to seven year funding term typically. However, if it's working well for you, why would you ever want to stop would be my question. Now keep in mind that consistency and discipline are part of the keys to your success through this process, which is why if you're not a cash flow maximization accelerated debt elimination student where you've subscribed to a two year coaching membership through VIP, the one and only reason that that should be the case is because you are disqualified by VIP. Otherwise, make sure you're a member because we will help you with that discipline. Number six, exploit the banking opportunities, which we're going to talk about. And finally, overcome human nature. We're also going to talk about that as well. So we've already covered number one and number two. We then want you to contact your trusted insurance professional. And there are a few must ask questions. I would recommend uh, that you either pause and write these down or rewind this and watch it again because the bottom line is we don't have enough time to sit and uh, pause too long on these questions. But a few questions that Eric has recommended that you ask your trusted professional is, how long have you been in business? That's an important question to know. Second, what is the name of the insurance company that you would be using? Third, how soon can you borrow the cash value and what percentage would be available to you? Fourth, what is the dividend credit history? Five, how flexible are your premiums? And if you change your premium, what underwriting, et cetera, must you go through? And six, is it direct or indirect recognition? And how does that affect you? Write these questions down when you have some extra time and just make sure that you approach your trusted professional asking for some of the answers to these. Going back to step four, you then need to design and purchase your policy and then consistently fund the premiums. Let's go through the timeline just so the listener better understands exactly how this process unfolds, Eric, because not being experienced with this myself, I would certainly wonder what should I expect if I were to approach you and decide to move forward with a policy? What's step one? Yeah, well, you know, here's a couple things, I guess, that are, are worth mentioning. This is a concept that can seem very complex, so we really want to work hard to try to simplify the concept. And if you believe that you can profit like a bank and you believe that you have the personal discipline which will go over sooner or later and when I show you the case study in a minute you'll understand why the dividend paying whole life insurance policy is the vehicle that's optimal for creating your own banking system I want you to be aware of what it takes to to achieve or to uh, purchase a policy. Number one, you want to work with somebody or discuss the options of how to create and design a policy. As I said, this needs to be something that is built specifically with high cash values, minimal insurance amounts, and overfunded. The second thing is you'll fill out an application, which is uh, not unlike most applications you've filled out in your life. Just a few pieces of, uh, of information that you need to provide, and then the ball gets rolling. The third is underwriting. And as you might have mentioned, as you might uh, have wondered about or thought previously, if it's a life insurance policy, do I have to go through underwriting and take a physical? And the answer is yes. Now, Nelson has a whole chapter in his book about what happens if you're not uh, insurable. So if you have health issues, but you'd still like to do this, there are a lot of options which um, your insurance professional or I could explain to you. Number four, the insurance company based on that health is going to give you an offer which you can then accept or decline. If you choose to accept it, you need to pay an issue and the policy will be issued. So let's get back to this idea of creating and designing your plan. Again, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but the idea here is the least amount of money for the largest death benefit is typically how people buy life insurance. And again, that's term, right? You've heard the ads on TV that for 12 cents a month, you could buy $40 million of life insurance if you're 40. That's not the idea here. This is how to solve the banking equation in your life. So in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to do the opposite technique, which is specially design a policy to fund the least amount of death benefit to accumulate the largest cash value. And the beauty here is that the IRS tells us exactly how we do this if we need to maximize the tax benefits of this policy. Not only does that help make it easy, but it also tells you the importance of working with someone who understands insurance to make sure that this is done correctly. Okay, so once that's done, then we basically can use that policy to go out and exploit the banking opportunities, right? 
That's correct. Again, you need to buy things in your life. So exploiting the banking opportunities is asking yourself the question, what do we buy in our lives? What are we purchasing that we might be able to get those dollars back to our family as opposed to transferring them to the banks? So and then once we do, we're able to start eliminating the need for the dependency on the banks. That's right. Your, your number one idea is to gradually eliminate the need for dependency on banks to recapture some of that interest. Two is create a pool of money to give you the ability to control 100% of your needs. Beside the financial part, being at the mercy of the bank's decision-making process can sometimes cause problems to some of the things that you want to do financially. Recapturing principal and interest, there's the ability to recapture some of the principal and interest that you previously paid to banks and other institutions. And then again, we've touched on this, begin to profit and avoid taxes being paid on those profits, again, assuming you've built the policy correctly. This too is a simple business based on transactions. The process doesn't change whether you use a bank or you use your own infinite banking concept, family bank. The only thing that changes is the way that you choose to implement the process. And that is what we call creating the bank of you. So let's give this idea here that Financing. Why would I want to? Why would I want to solve the banking equation in my life? And we've talked about this, but because you are going to do two things if you use a bank. One, you're either going to pay someone else interest to borrow money, or two, you're going to put your money in an institution where you're passing up interest that you could earn elsewhere. And this is a key concept. This along with the volume of interest being the main issue, you get those two things and you are on your way to solving the banking equation in your life because most of the world, from a financial perspective, focuses their energy on saving 5% and how to create interest on those savings while taxes, interest, and expenses are eroding 60% of their life. And we want you to understand that there's tremendous opportunity in that 60%. So let's look at this in a more fundamental example when we talk about an insurance policy the idea here is you have to save so save in an insurance policy save consistently just like you have to do in any other part of your life and the insurance policy has attached to it three benefits the insurance benefit which is the death benefit which we know how that works when you die your heirs get a lump sum of money but the two other places that you have are cash value and a loan department. The cash value is where you save your money and where you hope to get better benefits than you receive in a bank. Interest, dividends, and tax benefits. The loan department is where you get money when you need to access it. The insurance company will lend you money and collateralize your cash value. So if you have $100,000 built up in the cash value of your life insurance policy, you can borrow up to $100,000 or maybe just short of that from the loan department from the insurance ca company. Here's what's really important about this and why using a life insurance policy provides a unique benefit. As opposed to, you might be saying, well, I could just borrow money from my cash in the checking account. But again, you're looking for interest credits, dividends, and tax benefits as incentive for saving, and then you're looking for benefits when you borrow. When you borrow from the insurance company, your cash value continues to grow, and you pay back the loan to the insurance company. So let's look at how this works. This is one of the places where if you're researching this or you're working with somebody, you need to make sure there's integrity about this, okay? You need to make sure that they teach you how this really works. And I'm going to give you an example from a particular company. This is a hypothetical example, but I want you to understand the general concept of this, okay? What this particular example shows is a person who has elected to save $15,000 a year. Okay, so we get back to that. You have to save somewhere. You've got to work with your budget, figure out how much you can save, save that consistently. Uh, this is obviously where having discipline, having help with that discipline may be a, a big positive for you. And, and designing that budget, having that consistent amount that you feel good putting in. In this case, this person selected $15,000. Okay. It's an annual contribution to this policy, correct? That's the premium. That's the premium. We call it the premium. Okay. Now, what, so what is that, about uh, $1,250 a month? You got it. Yep. Okay. So this person has a, a pretty good amount of positive cash flow, 
and wants to put this money in for as long as they can. But what we want to show you here is let's look at buying a car and let's explore the three options. Okay, You could buy a car with cash. We know how that works. You're never going to earn much on your money and you're not going to owe anybody any interest. Very self-explanatory. Over a lifetime, you'll lose thousands of dollars of interest potentially by not earning on your money. You could also go to the banks and finance it, which would cost you thousands of dollars of interest, presumably paying that loan back. So hold on. Let me just see what I'm looking at here. We've got a net cash surrender value. Is this the cash value? That's how much you can borrow against every year. That's correct. Okay. So this individual hypothetically has contributed approximately $15,000 in year one, of which approximately $9,700 is available, or $9,800 is available. That's how much you can borrow against. That's correct. And then right there to the right, you see the death benefit that is uh, associated with this policy. Again, that that is a minimum death benefit determined by the IRS to get these benefits. So if this person passed away, their family would get those figures on the right-hand side, that death benefit paid to their, uh, to their loved one. What's jumping out at me here, Eric, is that after five years, hypothetically, if this individual had contributed $75,000, approximately that same amount would be available to them. That's right. And this is where we talked a little bit about how permanent life insurance can seem more expensive up front, but then it starts to cover itself. So this is why it's a five to seven year funding term, as we talked about earlier in the, in the conversation. That's right. So if you think about term insurance, you pay that out every year, you're not going to get anything back. If you look in the sixth year, and these results are are based on an illustration, so I want to be clear that this is not a guarantee that anybody gets this exact result. But in this particular uh, example, you had you would put in 75000 and in the sixth year, you'd already have more than you put in. So what you're telling me here is that after $75,000 being contributed in just five years, 20 years later, this person would hypothetically have more than twice that available to them. That's correct. Now, dividends are based on the profitability of the company, and so they could be more or less than what you're seeing here. But again, the idea is, is that more incentive to save in a vehicle like this versus what you're getting at the bank? And remember, that accumulation, if this policy is built correctly, which this particular one is, that would happen with no tax being paid every year and you would be able to withdraw that money as long as it's done correctly without income tax. Okay, so what's uh, possibility number two then? So the possibility number two is let's look at this from a banking perspective. Let's just say this person in the fifth year wanted to borrow $50,000 and was going to decide to pay themselves back at 6%. Now, remember, the insurance company collateralizes your cash. This part can seem complex, but it's really not. The insurance company will give you the loan for $50,000, and your money is going to grow largely like you never touched it. And the insurance company is going to charge you a rate of interest to borrow your money. But think about this. The idea here is not to pay the least amount of interest possible. The idea here is if you're thinking about this in terms of your own bank and paying yourself, would you want to pay yourself the least amount of interest or the most amount of interest? And so for this particular individual, they've decided that they're going to pay their loan back at, for five years at 6%. And I'm going to show you how this all unfolds, okay? Okay. By borrowing that money, They've paid themselves back, and you can see right here in this column, they've paid themselves back 38000 They borrow fifty, pay themselves back 11599 per year until it pays off just before the end of the fifth year. The second column that you see here, this is how much interest they paid the insurance company. So you might be thinking, this is where you might be thinking, well, why would I want to do that? Because I've just paid the insurance company interest, and if I put this money in my savings account, I would not pay anybody any interest. And you would be right. To this point, you've paid interest to borrow your money. But remember what I said. Your money continues to grow. As though you didn't touch it, right? That's right. Your money would continue to grow. And so you can see here on these cash surrender values that although you paid $6,274 of interest to the insurance company, you were credited $13,668 through the interest and the dividends on this policy over that same time frame. This, my friends, is the unique benefits. 
that it's built into a life insurance policy. I don't know of anything else that you could do, any other place you could put your money where you could borrow, put in 75, borrow 50, buy a car, and over that time frame, you would end up positive cash of $6,394. So this is a great example then of uh, how you could use the infinite banking policy to exploit the banks. But this doesn't even touch on the possibility of income producing asset acquisition through the infinite banking policy. Yeah. So let's say just hypothetically somebody wanted to use the $50,000 to put $25,000 down on a real estate property and use the other $25,000 to fix the place up and then it's renting and cash flowing at $500 per month let's say. Now all of a sudden that momentum continues to grow and the ability to repay that uh, the vehicle of this particular debt weapon is through the revenue of the of the rent, right? So this is a great um, opportunity for people who have a variety of investment goals to reach those goals on an accelerated basis through the use of this specific debt weapon, right? Yeah, the, you're so, not re for, number one. You're not restricted about what to use this money for. I think that's very important. Number two, remember that banking example. What's important with this process? What's the most important thing with that middle player? The bank must have the loans paid back. So again, the idea here is you've got to pay this loan back if you want it to look like that. This is, by the way, where most people fail. This is where you must uncut overcome step number seven which is the elements of human nature this is where the most illusory marketing can come from this is where all the problems happen so two things that are important here number one the loan must be paid back and number two if you are paying yourself back would you rather pay yourself back over five years seven years ten years would you rather pay yourself back at six percent eight percent and this is where having trusted advisors who really understand how to help you manage your cash flow well I think is, is a very important part of the plan. So whether you already have that in your life or you need to, to, to put that in play, if you don't have the discipline, if you can't overcome the human na nature, then this concept will fall apart just like anything else that you put in play in your financial life. And if you want to use it for real estate and you want to use it for investing in widgets, that's entirely up to you. The key is do it with something that you can pay back. Do it, don't put this, don't, I would highly advise against, don't take this money and go buy a Google IPO. That's not how this concept is designed. And again, if you get back to that example that I showed you, what would that policy look like potentially if that person bought five cars? What would that policy look back like if they financed their child's education? What would that look like if they bought 15 properties and paid it back? One property. What if they did nothing? All those are options. They're all dependent upon how you treat this uh, this entity and how you really want it to perform. I want to say here, and I know we're we're you know we're pressed on time, but I want to say this is what I alluded to earlier, which is why a lot of you won't be able to do this. You may not be positive cash flow. You may not have the discipline to save consistently, or you may not have the discipline to pay yourselves back. And this is not a commentary on retirement planning. This is a commentary on if you're interested in reversing or solving the banking equation in your life, I don't think you can do it with just one of these three. You have to be able to understand banking, you have to be able to understand how to use life insurance correctly, and you have to be able to understand how to get over your human elements. We're going to talk quickly about these things. I think these are a lot of fun. I talk about these with my, my wife. I talk about these with uh, my clients. But let's talk about five nature or parts of human nature. Number one is Parkinson's law, okay? Parkinson was a human behaviorist, and he studied what's called the time envelope of money. And the way it goes is if you get, and some of you may have teenagers, and you may really understand this. You give someone a job, and you give them three days to do the job. They're going to finish that job in three days. Give 10 days for the same job, and they're going to they're going to take all 10 days to finish it. And, and that manifests itself with your money, and it does so with expenses rising to equal income. A luxury once enjoyed becomes a necessity. Look at the phone there. I mean, all of us, who, who thought you'd ever be spending $100 a month on cell phone bills? Not when you had that rotary phone. But now no one could imagine life without it, it cars without air conditioning. I mean, there's a lot of these things. If you cannot lick this, if you can't avoid expenses always rising to equal income, not only do I not think you'll get ahead financially, but I certainly don't think you're a good candidate for the infinite banking concept. Two, Willie Sutton's law. 
if any of you listen to uh, Peter Boyles in the morning, he talks about Willie Sutton quite a bit. Willie Sutton was a bank robber, and uh, he always got caught. And the, as the story goes, a journalist asked Willie, why do you keep robbing banks? And his answer was, because that's where the money is. And so the idea here is wherever wealth is accumulated, someone will try to steal it. There's two key components here. Number one, if you can avoid losing taxes on your money, then you're increasing your chances of creating positive momentum. Taxes are a major headwind, and if you can avoid or minimize the impact of taxes, that's extremely important. And the second thing here is you better not steal from yourself. You better pay yourself back when you borrow. You better understand that if loans don't perform you and you can't do that, then there's no reason to be in the banking business. The golden rule, again, these are right out of Nelson's book, pay taxes on the seed or the harvest. Would you rather pay taxes today and avoid tax on your profits or would you rather avoid taxes today and pay tax on all your profits? This is a major difference between where most of you save for retirement in 401ks and IRAs. So this is a little bit different. And if you look at why this is potentially important, again, this is not a substitute for those vehicles, but it certainly is a compelling reason to have some uh, tax diversification in your life. If you take a dollar, and you double that dollar every day for 20 day or every year for 20 years that dollar would be worth a million 48 if you tax it at 17% that's what the figure looks like and at 27 even more compelling so the need to avoid taxes or minimize taxes as much as possible on your profits is certainly uh, a compelling one if you're listening today, if you've made it this far, if you're willing to go and try to solve these areas in your life and take further steps, you've already overcome this one, but this is called the arrival syndrome. Uh, there are probably things about banks you, that you don't understand. There are probably things about insurance companies that you're not aware of. And if you don't have an open mind uh, and you're not willing to look at things differently, uh, then then again, I think you're, you're doomed to failure and you're certainly not a good candidate for the infinite banking concept. You're a superhero dum-dum. Yeah, that's... Uh, not what you want to be. That's right. That's not... But that's you got not. a cool mask and a cool cape, so you might <laughs> feel good about yourself still. <laughs> yeah, you've heard Malcolm Forbes, the dumbest people I know are those who know it all. So we really want to have an open mind. And the last one, which again, I think is really important with infinite banking in general is that... It's not always about where you can get the best rate of return. It's not always about what your annual percentage rate is. It's about using your money and using it to redirect or, or recapture interest that you've potentially lost to other institutions. And that's what banks do, and that's what you need to be willing to do if you believe that you want to uh, solve the banking equation and use infinite banking in your life. And again, it's if we think about what that does, it's about eliminating payments of interest to others, paying back the same rate of interest to something that you own and control, and minimizing taxation to create a tailwind for wealth accumulation. So at this particular point of the, of the discussion, I like to insert or um, include a, a segment called Off the Cuff, where I just throw some questions at Eric that you may be wondering. And he's going to do his best to give you an answer. Just keep in mind that these answers can change over time. It really does depend on you, your individual circumstances, which, which is why we include that free consultation. Uh, not only does VIP include a personal implementation coaching session at no charge, but uh, we're going to ask Eric and his team at the Paradigm Group to do the same for you so that you can get uh, as much information as possible in order to make the right decisions for your future. So the first question that I would like to ask you, Eric, is how much money do I need to pull the trigger on an IBC policy, and is there a policy that's too big or too small? I'll answer the second one first. I don't think there's a policy that's too big or too small. You can't put in $100 a month and expect to buy a Ferrari out of the thing, so there's a relativity there. But Can I, think, I put in $100 a month? Yeah, absolutely. We have people who put in less, so yeah, there's no limit on that. But I think the bigger question is, how much money do I need to pull the trigger? You need to be able to analyze your positive cash flow to be able to come up with that number. So it's more a product of cash flow than it is a minimum number. I don't know if you guys are noticing the the pattern of cash flow management that continually comes back into this discussion, but if you have not involved yourself with a discussion with VIP yet about your management plan of your cash flow, then I would highly encourage that to become your first step. Next, are major insurance companies selling this? And what do they say about this concept? 
you know, that's different from different insurance companies. Some uh, really support it. Some, I think, you know, it, it, it may be an accounting nightmare for them a little bit, uh, but some companies are totally dedicated to it. So that really, that really runs the gamut. They, some say really positive things. Um, I don't think anybody would say negative. I think if there is a concern from the insurance company, it's that the person is not going to have the discipline to pay it back and that it won't perform the way they wanted it to because they stole from themselves. Okay. So what, what circumstances would lead a smart person to buy one of these policies? Well, I mean, here's the thing. You can use life insurance as a way to create retirement benefits, and, and a lot of people do that. But specifically to the infinite banking concept, I think if you have a desire to solve the banking equation in your life, you understand why it can be profitable, and you're committed to overcoming your human elements, then it's worth looking at it. So exactly what happens if I'm unable to keep up with my payments or I'm unable to pay it back on time? The word exactly is tough because it depends on how long you've done it and where you are in your policy and so forth. But there's a there's a pretty significant amount of flexibility to these things to be able to accommodate changes in your lifestyle and changes that come up. We know one thing, and that is nothing ever happens exactly like we planned it. And so there is, uh, I'm not going to say there's no consequences, but if you understand it correctly, you should be able to minimize any negative consequences that come up by life changing. So is that something that I would work with my my trusted professional on yeah. if that need happens? Whether they're exposed to uh, infinite banking as a concept in general or just a life insurance expert, if they understand life insurance, they should understand how flexible it is and what you might want to be aware of in terms of flexibility. Are the rules able to change? Well, you know... I'll, I'll never say never, but this uh, when you when you buy a life insurance policy, there's a contract nature to it. So precedent has been that they don't change, and that if there are changes, it would be on new policies, not old ones. Um, so I think you probabilities are pretty good that they won't. Can I own more than one policy? Absolutely, Nelson. Uh, and I have never asked him personally this question, but uh, I believe he's owned upwards of 40 or 50 policies at any given time. So how does annual growth work and what is the rate based upon? So every company has what they call their guaranteed interest rate, which is an internal rate that they guarantee on your policy. I'm not going to go into the numbers because they're different for different companies. Um, that is based on how the insurance company wants to uh, attract people to their uh, company. and. But most of the growth comes from the dividend, which is a product of how profitable the company is, and then they pay a portion of that profits back. The uh, process of a dividend, when you learn more about it, is one of the key components. It's one of the reasons why the tax benefits can be so great. So at what point, if ever, does it make sense to pay up my policy with equity from my home? I would say never. Now, I, I, there are some people who probably differ, but... Uh, if you're my client, you're not taking equity out of your home to fund a life insurance policy. If you're a VIP student, the same would be true. So what are the most common reasons that this concept would fail? I'd say twofold. Number one is not adequately understanding it up front, uh, which could be either your lack of desire to, to know enough or it could be, you know, even in some cases, deceptive marketing techniques. Uh, and then two is the inability to discipline yourself from a cash flow standpoint over time. So please explain for me, if you could, the Comdex rating, and is that something that I need to be considering? Well, I mean, I think if you have a good agent representing you, you probably don't need to consider it because it should be something they're doing on your behalf. But essentially, it's a ranking of the uh, quality of insurance companies. I wouldn't say that a high Comdex means that it's a perfect policy for infinite banking, and I also wouldn't say that a lower Comdex means that it's a company that you should shy away from because there are a lot of elements to it. So that's why probably something that you should make sure your insurance professional can help you with. So how does an agent you know, let's face it, a salesperson of these types of policies get paid. How, how is it that you're paid if I buy a policy from you or the Paradigm Group? And isn't that money that I could just save? Yeah, that's a t you know that, that's the the question that uh, all salespeople need to, to to answer. Of course, I think of myself much more as an advisor, and you need to be the one who makes the decision if this is right for you. You need to just look at things for the way they are. That being said, uh, typically insurance agents are going to be paid a commission. Um, 
And, you know, I think the savings isn't that money I could save. I mean, to, to me, you're looking for benefits and someone's going to get paid no matter where you put your money in. And if you put your money into the bank, the bank's going to get those profits. And if you put your money into an insurance company, the agents and the insurance companies are going to make money. So there, everybody, there's going to be profits somewhere. The idea is after profits for everybody else, are you getting better benefits? And that's where I think um, this policy or this idea has a lot of strength because, again, we're not trying to compare this to a stock. We're not trying to compare this to real estate. We're trying to compare this to where you can solve the banking equation in your life. So how do the insurance companies make their money? The reality is this. Every financial product, every financial tool, the institution selling you that product is trying to convince you to give up your money for a certain period of time. They want control of that money as well. And so at, at the end of the day, it's about having the ability to invest your money with their money in what's called a pooled investment. And so uh, they've done that for 150 years and they know how to do it very well. And fortunately, they know how to do that well enough, or at least they have in the past, to be able to make money for themselves and also pass through some pretty significant benefits to you. So they're not just investing my money to earn enough to pay me and the other policyholders? You know, they, you might be able to say that they are. I think really all investments come down. I mean, look, you buy a stock, you're lending your money to the to the company in exchange for some ownership. You buy a bond and you're lending your money through a debt instrument. You know, you buy a house and you're you know you're lending money to the equity and, and sitting it in the home, or you're lend or you're using a bank's money. So no matter where you go, there's some element of that. It's it's impossible to get around. I think the key is for any investor is look at your options. What are your alternatives, and where do you think you're getting the most bang for your buck? And again, if we compare this to a bank, I think that the savings benefits, the consuming benefits, and the profitability benefits, if used correctly, built correctly, and managed correctly, can be pretty compelling. All right. Well, I really appreciate all the time you've, you've taken with me uh, on my behalf and the listeners as well. Do you have any final things that you'd like to say to the person listening here today? Yeah. I mean, first of all, thank you very much for taking some time. Uh, I know this can be a little bit long and confusing. The work is not done. You really need to continue the due diligence uh, that you're doing now so you can, if Number one, you choose that you this is something you want. And number two, you really believe that this is something that you can do the right way. Uh, you know, you've got some work to do to make sure that this gets done right in your life. If you'd like to have a free consultation from us, we're certainly willing to do that. But if you also if you have a professional that you're already working with and you'd like us to talk uh, to them to help you make sure you get this right, that's one of the value adds that will allow, you know, allow you to do based on this class. You know, it, it really is about banking, personal discipline, and, and using the right vehicle. So I, I never want that to be, uh, to be lost. And then lastly, whether, again, you said this up front, but it's really important, whether it be investing legal or tax advice, make sure you go to the full extent to, to be sure that what you're doing not only is built right, but that you use it right uh, over time. And I think Matt's going to help cover some of those steps if, if that's something you need from us, uh, how you can go about contacting us. All right, great. So a little bit about VIP financial education to refresh your memory. First and foremost, we were founded in 2002 and built by a team of 44 experts. We became national leaders on cash flow, debt, and credit. And we provide all of our online and on-site classes for free in order to give you that fundamental foundation of education needed to make the right decisions to reach your long-term goals more quickly than you may otherwise. Implementation and accountability are how we make our money. So if the coaching services that we sell are of value and the return on that investment makes sense, then we'll suggest you move forward. Otherwise, we do disqualify about four out of 10 people that we speak with based on our coaching that we provide. We do have a perfect reputation with guaranteed results, which is why we're so strict about who we allow into our program. That's not designed to offend or insult you if you are disqualified, but rather to protect you. We have countless testimonials from people who are achieving extraordinary results, some of which you can see at aboutvipfinancialeducation.com. We've provided our training to many companies over the years, which include NASA, Cary, Remax, Your Castle, the Paradigm Group, which was uh, featured here today, uh, several nonprofits, including the largest in the United States, the Society for Financial Wellness, 
Metro Brokers, the police department, the list goes on and on and on. And as you can see here, here's a testimonial from the chief of police, Jim May. When I first saw this, I thought, holy smokes, it was very informative and a great process. We love having the classes at the station and we are really making great progress with our coach and can't wait until the next class. That's from Jim May. Also, you can see we have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. You can even search NASA debt-free class and see that we've provided this to both Johnson and Kennedy Space Centers. Here's a testimonial from the director. I am the program director that has been offering the VIP education to the employees of NASA. We have received wonderful feedback and plan to increase the availability of the curriculum. In one word, awesome. I would strongly recommend this information to anyone. And I certainly recommend and encourage you to share these classes with the people you care about because it is going to require each and every person in this country, one household at a time, to choose to do something better with their own individual household and personal economic circumstances to change the social economics of this country. So what do you do now in order to take the next step and implement what you're learning? The first is to complete the feedback form that will pop up at the end of this class. So when the class ends here in the next minute or two, you will see a feedback form that will uh, appear on your screen. Please. Uh, complete that which will qualify you for the second part which is a consultation it's totally free you will also receive an additional free coaching session with VIP so even if you've already had a free coaching session it will be time for you to get another one so you'll complete your cash flow cruncher spreadsheet which we showed you uh, when you schedule your free coaching session with us you will then be sent a confirmation email with that spreadsheet attached the second step is to design your short-term plan by reverse engineering your long-term goals. And we're going to cover that with you and give you the guidance you need. The bottom line is the process, regardless of how complicated it, it may or may not seem, can be easy when it's broken into small, simple steps. And it will also never require you to disclose confidential financial information when you're taking advantage of these free gifts. Uh, here's a look at that cash flow cruncher spreadsheet again. The feedback form is all we're looking for. So do please complete that form now. You'll receive the free no sales, no pressure counseling sessions from both Eric and his team at the Paradigm Group, as well as another free session from VIP. You'll also be qualified for a free 3D affiliate uh, referral partnership with VIP where you can earn up to six figures per year to help people understand this information and just simply share the free classes that we provide. You can be paid significantly for that as a token of our appreciation. You'll also be sent other invitations to all of our free classes. So you're now qualified to attend all of our free classes and those invitations are sent by email. So I strongly encourage you to take advantage of all of those. This is your chance to determine if and how the infinite banking concept can improve your life. If you'd like to expedite your process, you can always call us at 866-969-2738. Otherwise, please complete the feedback form and we'll be in touch with you shortly. We really appreciate your time and thank you very much for allowing us to be your friends in financial know-how. And this is to your continued success. Thank you and make it a great day.